Hello YouTube, Gamecom is over and Frontier has basically given their presentations for what's forthcoming in 2.2. Now if you remember I did a video earlier that said that if Frontier really wants to knock it out of the ballpark, they not only have to show us what's coming in 2.2, but also show off, even if it is very early work in progress, material for 2.3, and maybe even hint at what's on the horizons, pun intended, for 2.4. And we got none of that latter. It was entirely about what's in 2.2, with the exception of a couple of brief mentions that yes, character creator is indeed coming in 2.3, but we saw no art or in-game evidence that, you know, it's any further along than what was shown off last year in stills, uh, as far as actually being integrated into the game at this point. And that's a little bit disappointing. The other thing that became abundantly clear is they also needed to give milestone and rough estimation dates for the delivery of 2.3 or 2.4 because the big question is going to be when does season 3 come? Is it going to be sometime in 2017 or are they still going to be sticking to the let's get four updates out in this year for season 2? And as we go forward with the announcement that the release date for 2.2 is going to be mid to late October, that seems to tell me that no don't expect 2.4 slash 3.0 this year. Now, I think that logistically there's another reason for this, and that is that it would coincide with the time of release for Planet Coaster as well, which is their new IP that they're self-publishing, and they just may not internally at this point have the resources to both market Planet Coaster and Elite Dangerous Season 3. Now, I understand there are people are like, but these are two very different games aimed at two very different audiences, and while there is a lot of truth in that it does take time effort and resources to market both products and they just may not as a company have those resources available and therefore they don't want to risk basically damaging one IP or the other by trying to do both at the same time and taking on more than they can chew now it could be that I think it's also the fact that 2.1 and 2.2 have been such delayed this year that those delays have kind of bumped into each other is the other overriding factor. So I might be reading a little bit too much into that, but that's kind of what it takes on from my perspective. Now, as far as what they showed off at Gamescom, I have to say that it's kind of mixed to me. There are some good things, there are some bad things, and then there's some things that I'm just like, eh. So day one, they were showing off the passenger system here, and I have to say that I can't help but be disappointed here, that it took 18 months to deliver essentially what is a copy and paste mechanic. Granted, you need passenger cabins instead of cargo racks, but since they don't necessarily have to be modeled into the ships and things of that nature, since we don't have space legs yet to go look at them, it's basically just statistics in a stats file and then copy and paste, change some verbiage on the mission text and what the procedural generation can put into different areas of text. But as far as interaction with the game universe, especially with bulk passengers, it's no different than taking a mission to haul bio waste or semiconductors or gold or doing a data courier run. It's basically the exact same interaction with the game and the universe. Take people from point A, take them to point B within a given amount of time, don't make too many stops, and Bob's your uncle. That's not what I was hoping for. What was I hoping for? I don't know if I can expressly describe what I was ideally hoping for, but I think it was something closer to like FS Passengers for FSX, which you'll look at videos on my YouTube channel about, where maybe there was some sort of contextual menus that would pop up and you need to, I don't know, put on in-flight entertainment or assign your stewardesses to deliver drinks and foods to your passengers and give priority to passenger cabin A that's a luxury suite versus passenger cabin B that's first class versus, you know, steerage, back in the back, the economy class, if you want to be space Airbus or Ryan, some Ryan Air or whatever. They did introduce the Beluga, which is the new passenger liner on the same scale and probably priced as the Cutter, the Anaconda, the Corvette, it gives people another option who maybe aren't all into combat or cargo haulage necessarily, per se. They did show off the VIP missions, which do seem to have a few more scripted events that you can achieve or go and do, especially if you're hauling VIP passengers. And I guess that's okay. I mean, it's going to be things like go here for X amount of time, go here, give us, get us this, go there, do that. Okay, I, I guess that does 
add a new element of gameplay and variety. But again, I don't see how it's that much different than you pick up a cargo mission and it's like, deliver 27 units of, or tons, or whatever they are, of tea to this location. And you get ready to go to that location and they say, nope, we got another opportunity for an extra 100,000 credits. Go send it to this port over there, halfway across the freaking known bubble. So the mechanics are already in place with cargo missions and things like that. I just don't see how passenger missions are really any different. The third type of passenger mission they showed off was space tourism, which is much like the others. Go here, scan a beacon or a wave signal or something like that, and some text will pop up and tell you why it was chosen as a destination. Now, of the three of them, that probably has the most potential of being somewhat interesting. If for no other reason, at least then you get a blurb of who discovered it, if it's a you know, picturesque view or something like that, or you get to understand a little bit more about the lore and depth of the story behind the Elite Dangerous Universe, which is sort of kind of presented to you, but not necessarily. You kind of have to go looking for it if you're really interested, if you've never played any of the previous Elite games and want to know about what's going on in the universe with the different factions and things like that, maybe sites of historical battles or events of significance within the Elite universe. So of all of them, I think the space tourism is probably the best of the three. Now, if they'd added bulk passenger mechanics just simply because it was very easy to do in a copy-paste and gives folks a third option, when maybe a VIP mission hasn't sprung up or something like that, I could be a little bit more forgiving of putting those mechanics in there. But largely, throughout all of the passenger missions, I'm just looking at basically copy-paste mechanics. It's no different than hauling good. I mean, they're like, but the background sim will change the flavor text. I don't care if it's refugees or tourists or, you know, rich socialites that I'm hauling. At the end of the day, that's just text. You know, the fact that it's tied into the background sim and system states and things like that. Okay, here's my question. If we start hauling out refugees from planets, will their populations in the background sim start to decrease? Likewise, if we start hauling people to locations like colonists or something to uh, new outposts and things like that, will the background sim take that into account and start increasing the populations of those systems, especially if they're going to open up a couple of new bubbles? Now, if those mechanics happen to be in the game, and frankly, we don't know yet, they really haven't said one way or the other, at least not in any of the live streams that I saw, then we could be on to something then this could be something of dramatic improvement that does allow us to interact with the universe in a different way than we had before and start to try to influence parts of it as groups of players. In particular, if they're going to be starting a new inhabited bubble or two around Beagle Point and Jock Station, we're going to need a whole colonist out there. And you know, beyond community goals and game masters, direct interaction or manual interaction with the galaxy, and more and more of the stuff needs to be handled by the background sim. And whether it will or won't, we just simply don't know at this point. If it is, then I'm going to probably take back some of my remarks about the passenger missions in general and say, great job, Frontier. But it's to be determined at this point as far as I'm concerned. The other thing they showed off during day one was the fact that stations are getting new interiors based on the economic activity of that station. This is a space tourism services station that has touristy looking things on there. There's going to be an industrial hangar, so you'll be able to kind of tell what in type of port and what type of market you're going to based on the internals of that port. Now, I, for one, am glad to see that there's going to be more variety of station interiors and more variety of station interiors that makes it very clear what kind of port that you're landing to. But unfortunately, just like the current interiors have kind of gotten stale over time, these will too eventually as you go, oh, well, it's an industrial station. Pretty much all the industrial stations look the same. Oh, this is a service and tourism economy. You know, again, you're going to get to see the same ones over and over and over again it's nice to have a little bit of variety there, more than there certainly is right now, or has been at least. But this is one of those features that, to me, I kind of just shrug my shoulders and say, meh. It's nice to have, but given the choice between more art assets and more gameplay functionality, in particular more interaction with the background sim, and a dynamic economy, and things like that, 
I'd much rather see the latter rather than this. Not going to say this is bad. Again, more pretty in interiors to look at is certainly better. There's also going to be a couple of new station types, but we won't be able to interact with them. They're just going to be point of interest. A couple of the CQC stations will be in there, but we won't be able to dock or get missions or anything. And there will also be capital ship dry docks and shipyards and things of that nature that might play a role later on. Next up is ship launched fighters, which is kind of, I think, the big feature, at least for me, for 2.2. And overall, I think they got a lot of things right here. There's a few things that are kind of eh, or I'm eh about. But when we talk about new game mechanics, this is certainly one of them in a couple of respects. One, it's going to dramatically alter the balance of combat. No longer are Anacondas, Type 9s, and cutters and well cutters really aren't that much of a uh, mercy to players in open but or even npcs but it's going to give these ships the ability to adequately defend themselves now there's only a limited number of ships that can actually fit fighters the keelback i think being the smallest maybe the federal gunship uh rivaling that if it's the gunship drop ship one of those can also equip a fighter the Imperial Cutter, the Anaconda, the Type 9, and the Corvette. And I might be leaving one or two off that list. I don't have the comprehensive one in, in front of me. But not every ship will be able to mount fighters. And I think there's going to be a little bit of controversy about that. But the ships that can mount fighters desperately needs them. While I was doing my Imperial rank grind up, uh, I had a keelback because that was the best ship that, frankly, the shipyard I had docked at had available. Uh, that could land on small and medium pads. And let me tell you something, if you got interdicted even by a higher level NPC, your options were to maybe try and run and get away, but you really weren't fast enough to run away, and you certainly weren't well equipped enough to fight. The fighters, if you're carrying one on board, will certainly give you the option, I think, of, if not directly fighting, at least screening a getaway. And... I think this is going to be a godsend for a lot of merchant pilots. Yes, you're going to have to sacrifice some cargo space in order to carry fighters. But if you're trying to fly a Type 9 and tired of getting interdicted either by players, if you're in open or NPCs in any mode, you may well worth consider it. Now, the fighters are going to work as basically remote piloted vehicles. They're calling it telepresence. So the pilots and things like that are still on your physical ship. But you have to hire them. In order to hire them, there's a one-time cost associated with doing so, depending on their starting rank, and then they take a percentage of your income as salary. And I really like this model. This shows where it can be going when multi-crew is introduced. Now, they have walked back and said, don't expect NPC crew members for the initial release of multi-crew, but who knows? They could be there or in a build sometime after that and add it into the game to where if you're playing in solo mode if you don't have any friends to play Elite Dangerous you can hire NPC crew members to man those stations instead and uh, that'll be nice to see I also hope to see that we'll get their player avatars and stuff like that in a 3D model form in 2.3 or 2.4 depending or even 3.0 or sometime in the near future uh, so that these people that you hire will be on the bridge of your ship because many of these ships do have at least two seats, if not more, available on the bridge. So I hope that they'll be filling some of that in as well. Now, one of the nice things that you can do is you can buy a lower-ranked NPC and then level them up, which will in turn be cheaper than hiring somebody of equivalent rank off the market. And I believe you'll be able to hire up to expert, maybe dangerous, off the market or the crew lounge. But if you want somebody that's deadly or elite, you're going to have to train them up to that point. But if you start with a novice and train them up to, say, expert, they're going to cost you less than what hiring an expert off the board will. Now, these crew members will stay on your ship until you dismiss them or until your ship gets blown up, at which point your crew members will die and you'll have to go get new crew, uh, crew members. So if you've leveled people up from novice to elite and your ship gets blown up, well, you've got to go find yourself some new pilots. Now, there is a system there that is, you can only have so many pilots on board your ship at one time, and any other crew member that you have uh, are essentially on shore leave at the time, and if your ship gets blown up, apparently it's the only people who are part of your active crew that get killed. 
Now, the other thing they showed off was ship transfer and remote cell. So those of us who used book, uh, Sidewinders as bookmarks before the bookmark system came along, you now can remotely sell all of those vehicles. And there's also talk of a shadowy contract or contact available at stations that will allow you to redeem bounties and pay off fines and things of that nature for a percentage of the cut, even if it's like 20 or 30 percent. How many times have you been basically interdicted, you kill the person, you end up with a 150,000 credit bounty in some random system that you'll never go to again, and it just basically sits there until you either die or, you know, it's just there in your transactions tab. Well, with this system, yeah, you might lose 20, 30 percent, but who cares? You at least cash it in and get it off your thing and get a little bit of money for it. These are great quality of life improvements. The ship transfer mechanic, I'm not... It's needed. I'm not thrilled with the way that it's implemented. It's going to be instantaneous. Now, instantaneous, but there's a cost associated with the value of the ship multiplied by the distance in which it needs to travel. So if you need to get your fleet from, say, Founders World to Jacques Station, and you know you want to move a cutter from point A to point B, that's probably going to be very, 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 very expensive to do. But I would like to see some sort of countdown timer, so it's just not totally instantaneous. It may only need to be 5, 10, 15 minutes, something like that, but I wish that there's a timer there. And as one of my friends, Elios, was talking about maybe a cooldown saying that you can only move a ship like once per day or something along those lines. They're trying to balance it with cost mechanics right now. I do wish that there was a little bit of a dynamic there as well, because I can imagine some of these people who try to blockade stations, all of a sudden they're going to kill somebody in their trade conda, and you know, literally if they're just taking off from a station, they're just going to go call in whatever their, their fighter ship of choice is going to be, and five seconds out, they're going to be out hammering you with their combat ship. Again, changes to dynamics and all of that good things. The other thing, though, I do find a little bit more encouraging is I think it is going to encourage people to have more than one ship. I do have a couple of ships. I have a gunship that probably I'll remote sell, although I'll have to look and see how many credits I'll lose. Actually, at this point, it probably doesn't really matter if I do lose 10, 15 million credits on it. Uh, but like my Imperial Courier, there are times that I stop off and I need a ship that's a little bit smaller. And it will be nice to bring that ship over and, you know, have it fully modified as well as my uh, cutter. And I hope that we also get to kind of name ships so that we can get an idea of what they're about. Uh, so that I know that if I have two cutters or two couriers set up, like I have one set up for ground attack and planetary assault missions. And I have another one that's just a general putzing around doing missions that I ordinarily couldn't go to because my ship's too large. So it might encourage people, including myself, to build a couple of three ships, maybe a large cargo container like a Type 7 that lands on a medium pad. I think the Type 7 lands on a medium pad. I might be wrong about that. Or let's say a, a trade python. That, that one I do know lands on a medium pad. Uh, or Type 6 or something like that that can haul a little bit of cargo for some of the missions that I come across, especially when I need to collect materials for power play. And that's another feature, and I guess that the third major feature that came out with this is going to be a lot of quality of life improvements, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So other than the instant transfer of ships, most of the rest of the quality of life things I'm kind of okay with. I will make one more statement about the ship launched fighters that apparently they're going to come with a 3D printer that you'll be able to print new fighters as you're going along. The problem I have with that mechanic is why not scarabs? Why can't we just remotely print scarabs as we go along too and it, we just have to rebuy printer material? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think that they should be munitions they should be expendable and fairly cheap to replace, but I think once they're destroyed, you gotta go dock at a station somewhere and replace them. I don't think that they should be able to be replaceable in the middle of content, uh, in the battle of combat, with the exception of maybe through a synthesis option and with a buttload of resources in order to do it. I don't know, I'm kind of 
eh, I, I'm not too happy with that mechanic. But everything else in the quality of life pass, I'm pretty much okay with. The new system map, with being able to render planetoids and things like that in 3D as they actually appear, so you can get some visual idea of where some landmarks are, is great. The explorers are going to dig that. The new galaxy map with the ability to filter through star types so you can root around maybe hostile parties as well as maybe factions you don't want to deal with as well as being able to define a path by say scoopable stars. Fantastic addition to the game. And those are refinements, quality of life things that I've come to expect from Frontier as they continue to iterate into the game. Now, the bad part of this is there still seems to be no more substantial interaction with the background simulation. I might be wrong there when it comes to passenger mechanics. Maybe it will be if you start hauling refugees out of System A and into System B that the, over time the population of System A starts to decline and the population of System B begins to increase. I've really not paid that much attention. Maybe it already kind of does that based on trade activity and things of that nature, but it really doesn't seem like it to me. Second of all, there needs to be a more dynamic economy. It's now more varied than it used to be with the introduction of 2.1 changes. So not every station sells goods within the same range. Some will sell and buy goods at greater and lower prices than others. But within those systems, the economy system, the economic systems are still relatively stagnant within a very narrow band of what players can influence. I still would like there to be a full mode of production, a production tree, if you will, that if you and your friends bring more of items or materials A, B, and C in, it'll produce more of widget one, which would then drive down the price, and then you could trade those items, you know, widget ones to another station for greater profit and allow groups of players to work together to achieve more of a supply chain and logistics management side of the game that frankly isn't there without having to necessarily have empire building as per se as part of the game. Second thing, power play needs to be substantially overhauled. In fact, I'm on the cusp of leaving ALD for no other reason than it's more of a hindrance than a help at this point. You cannot grind both your power play rank and up your pilot's rating with a pilot's federation and imperial navy and things of that nature at the same time. And it needs to be a both and. There needs to be a way that power play interacts with both your pilot's federation rank and your naval rank. I would also like to see some exclusivity there. That if you join up, we don't need a bunch of people running around as king admirals. You know, king in the Imperial Navy, admiral in the uh, Federal Navy. I mean, it just doesn't make any logical sense. Uh, I think that it should be restricted. That if you join a power play faction, that that's how you get unlock access to that particular faction's ships and start gaining rank in their navy. Maybe keep the current rank system and call it a security clearance and tie permits to your security clearance level. Maybe, you know, you're a pilot with no faction or something like that, but you've gained the trust of both the Empire and the Federation to operate within their trade lanes in restricted systems. I could accept that, that it's a trading permit. That's what it really should be called, a system access permit or a system trading permit. And keep that system pretty much as it is today, and then move over to a rank system, but you have to join a power play faction in order to gain rank, and you gain special modules like it is now based on your power play sub-faction but access to certain ships. Now this probably does screw over the independent and alliance factions to a degree but maybe have those factions impact your pilot's federation rank to a greater degree. You hand in merits there and maybe it improves your combat rating with the pilot's federation or the trade rating or the exploration rating uh, depending on you know how all of that works or which sub-faction there that you are subscribed to. Not sure what that would do for Archon Delaney at this point, but at any rate, those are just some minor details and suggestions of things that you know aren't fixed, nor do they have any indications of making improvements. Quali These would be serious quality of life improvements that need to be done, frankly, as part of Season 2, if not very early on in Season 3 at the very latest. Finally, I'm going to leave on this. Watch the Day 4 interview with David Braben on the Elite Dangerous YouTube channel, the first 60 seconds. 
you'll see a man who was genuinely excited at the fact that space games are back in the industry eye that he was going to get to play No Man's Sky as the recording of the video. It wasn't released yet, so he hadn't gotten to. And then he almost had a boyful, gleeful enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm for the new Call of Duty Infinite Warfare game. As he said, he hadn't played a Call of Duty game in quite some time, but this one's set in space, so I've got to do it. And there's just just like, a, like again, a, a, a youthful enthusiasm in his face and voice that I believe is genuine. And I think he's excited to see this genre of games back. And then he goes on to mention Mass Effect, Andromeda, and Star Citizen as well, looking forward to games coming out. You know, as he said, Mass Effect sometime next year and Star Citizen whenever it, it ends up being released. And I think that he is excited to see this niche market or this segment of the market come back to the forefront with a lot of healthy games out there in the industry. He seems me seems to me as very genuine about that. And the way that he can gleefully mention other products out there on the market that he's excited to go play, and I believe he actually probably will go and play that, especially Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. It wouldn't surprise me if you don't go and uh, find a, a Commander Braben in the middle of uh, Infinite Warfare and have to shoot him down. We'll see. But at any rate, that's something that's always struck me, that Braben has always come off as somebody who is respectful and enthusiastic about what it is that he's doing and also has had the ability to tell people that I would love to but it's just not in the immediate future or anytime soon and has I think a fairly realistic level of expectations I think in one of his videos he said it was always hopelessly ambitious but trying to take things in bite-sized morsels that they can chew and then, you know, after they finish chewing that bite, uh, maybe go in and tweak the flavoring a little bit before taking the next bite. You know, add a little bit more salt, as it were, and then take off the next bite and try to chew that. Hopefully they continue building out. Hopefully they'll address some of the long-running concerns with the games in the next few point releases and into Season 3. I think they have until the end of Season 3, really, to get some of those things right. If they do that's going to be a very long, successful future for the Elite franchise. If they don't, don't know. It might become a victim of being too early to the market and other people out there with competing products that do it better. We'll have to wait and see. Thank you very much for sticking with this almost half hour long video. But I will be doing it again for the Star Citizen Gamescom presentation here. Uh, very shortly, as well as a couple other videos on other subjects, as it were. So thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, do all those fun things, and I will see you out there. Until next time, take care.